We have our chair here for whom I would like her to give her open remarks. My name is Dr. Diana Ondieki, and I'll be your host for this meeting. So Professor Chesser, uh, welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Diana, for giving me this opportunity. I, my role is just to welcome everybody to this morning session. Um, we have been given a brief on why we have this. It's to get out of the comfort zone in terms of what we know as medics and to just join uh, the other world where things are learned differently. We are not going academic here, which is getting people to tell us things which maybe in the medical school we don't learn. And as we face the world, we, face, we are faced by the real world, which is not uh, in black and white. So um, I don't want to spend my time. I want to welcome everybody. We have a great speaker today, which uh, I want to leave Diana to finish because she's the main coordinator. Otherwise, our objective in the department is to spread this to other areas of the university, which is picking up. And it is the wish of the dean that it goes wide in the university as the other programs which are used to help the students cope are going. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Chesser. Um, the, the thing that we'll be discussing today is uh, work-life balance. Um, this is an issue that most, most people struggle with in these modern times. And uh, Zig Ziglar, an entrepreneur and businessman said, you cannot consider yourself to be successful in your business life if you're struggling in your other aspects of life. And uh, you, you cannot consider being successful in career, uh, being successful in life. Uh, there has to be a trade-off, a kind of balance where um, you are able to let go of one area so that you can be able to go and uh, grow and thrive in a different aspect of life, an issue of uh, setting healthy boundaries. And the, the good book says, um, of what shall it benefit a man to gain the whole world? and to lose his own soul. And um, this is my hope that we'll be able to cover this in this topic. We have a great speaker who will be taking us through it, uh, Dr. Wale Akinyemi. Uh, Dr. Wale Akinyemi is a renowned author, motivational speaker, entrepreneur, and the founder of uh, Power Beast. Um, he is a person who writes in the national newspaper. And I've been able to read, uh, I'm sure most of us have read his articles. And one of the articles he wrote on was on work-life balance. And it was put in a very simple and clear way to a point where you actually feel that it's actually actionable. He is a person who walks the talk. He actually preaches water and uh, drinks water. And I believe he'll be able to do uh, justice to this topic. Um, without further ado, I would like to welcome uh, Dr. Wale Akinyemi. Uh, Dr. Wale Akinyemi, welcome. Thank you very much. Good morning. Uh, good morning. It's such an honor to be with you today. Thank you for granting me this privilege to be with you this morning. I have looked forward to it and I'm really excited. Thank you. Uh, welcome. Thank you. Now, um, you know, when you tell me to talk about work-life balance, um, <laughs> I don't know if I'm balanced myself, but I will just um, tell you a little bit about my life. Now, the most important thing to me in life, after my faith and all that, is my family. Um, I've been married for 30 years. And um, my wife and I are such close friends today and you know I had known her probably for about 10 years before we got married so that's a 40 year friendship uh, or more and um, when I'm away from the house um, like I am now I'm actually traveled it, it, it becomes so expensive because we are always on the phone um, there were times when I would leave the house very early in the morning and talking with my wife on the phone and we don't stop talking until I get to the office. And the same thing happens on my way back and throughout the day. Now my children, my first son is married. So he's left home. My second son is, has also left home. 
my daughter, because my baby has also more or less left home. And so my wife and I find ourselves very often as the only two people in the house. The Bible says that if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? And the truth is nothing. And so if we had not built the right balance um, in the early years, we would have added to the statistic the number of people that their relationships break up when their children have left home because they suddenly realize there's nothing. So I'm going to be more or less giving you some of the practicalities of the things that we have done. I run a very, very hectic schedule. Um, there was a time I remember I was doing some work for the, as a consultant for the UN. And in one week, uh, Sunday to Sunday, I had been in, I think, five countries. Uh, I, by reason of my work, I have to read a lot because one minute as a consultant, I could be working with Kenya Port Authority on shortening the turnaround time for ships coming into Kenya. And the next minute, I am working with a bank to improve their customer experience. So my work spreads across very diverse spectrums, meaning I have to read a lot, okay? I am just building the case so you realize how busy I got back to my to I got back in at about 2 a.m. this morning. I don't have a social life, I don't party or anything like that, but there was a dinner for the visiting president of the Africa Development Bank. And um, I was there because we know each other. And that went on for a very long time. But here I am here this morning. Uh, my family, like I said, is very tight. My, my children are my friends. If you look at my phone logs, you will find out that 95% of my calls and WhatsApp messages are to my family. And the same for all of them. There have been times when we just laugh because I am probably in the room on the phone with my daughter, my wife is on the phone with her son, or the children are talking to one another, and you know, or we just, just do a group thing. So how did we get here 30 years down the line? I don't know if I would call it a work-life balance, but more like a work-life integration. I think that's a more apt description of what we have done. A work-life integration. And because we have achieved that work-life integration, then it's balanced. I will tell you a story. My dad, and this is why um, any time doctors invite me for anything. I will do it in honor of my late dad. My dad was a, he was a medical doctor, okay? And um, he so loved 
his work was a pediatrician. And I remember my dad had no concept of, I mean, doctors are always on duty. I have seen, you know, growing up, people come to knock on the door at 2 a.m. because there is a sick child. I have seen all sorts. Um, Christmas Day, Easter, whatever, my dad was in the hospital. So how did we achieve work-life integration there? And I will quickly tell you, it was not my dad that did it. It was my mom. Mm -hmm. My mom had had, my mom was also, my mom was a scientist, uh, a biologist actually. And my mom had had it, she'd had enough of Christmas, the man is not there. Birthdays, the man is not there. He's just always in the hospital. So one Christmas, you know what my mom did? She said, he left for the hospital as usual. And she said, if you can't beat them, join them. At this time, he was the CEO of a children's hospital. My mother cooked up a storm. She cooked so much food, got caterers, and we went to spend Christmas in the hospital. She had prepared special Christmas food for everybody in the hospital. I'm talking of, this was in the 70s. I don't know if someone can still pull that off today. So she had cooked for everybody in her. So guess what? We spent the day in the hospital. But do you know, my mom did that to make a point, you know? But it made a bigger point. For once, when my mom and when we all saw all those kids, all those people, my dad instantly turned from villain to hero. That, oh my God, you mean this is what this man does? He became our hero simply because we now understood what he was doing. And I think that's the first major point. And after that, it was never a problem again. You know what had happened? Work-life integration had happened and therefore a balance could now be attained. And how was the work-life integration achieved? By the family understanding what he did. And so I decided I had learned from that. So everything I am doing, I try to make sure that my family understands what I'm doing understands the bigger picture of what I'm doing, that I have a program in Madare, which we call Zero to Hero. And um, we take kids from, young, young people from there. We mentor them. We train them. I bring all sorts of other facilitators. We train them. And um, after a period of training, we give them small seed capital to start up whatever dreams they have. Now, from there, I tell you, um, I have people who have left Madare. I have gangsters who have left Madare and are now happy family people leading very successful businesses. I can't tell you the number of young people we have 
paid school fees for up to university level. And, um, you know, it's so beautiful seeing what they're doing today. But you know what? If I had gone on my own to do that, I would be, it would be an uphill task. Um, so I took my family, my children, I opened up the opportunity to them. They loved it. My daughter is a beautician. And so, and she gets all these, you know, sponsors from around the world, you know, big makeup companies globally who she represents. And she started a program. Listen, because she saw what I was doing in the slums, she now started a program to transform lives through beauty. She began to teach them, a lot of young girls in this, began to teach them makeup, began to open up doors for them, and their lives began to find meaning. But you see, it was as a result of my daughter, my kids understanding what I'm doing. So even when they were younger, they knew that daddy has to work very hard so that they can go to good schools. Daddy has to work very hard so that we can transform lives and make a difference. And I remember one day, and once there is that integration and they, they will understand. I remember one day, my daughter came home from school. She was livid. She was so angry. And what got her angry? She was talking about her, some of her colleagues, her classmates in high school. Some of her classmates said, they're just unserious. Their parents have spent so much money. And yet they are playing around. They are doing, you see, through work-life integration. We now had established a balance. So people, mama, they know. Another day, she, my daughter came and said, that I just want to thank you. I said, what's up? She said she realized that in her class, she was the only person whose education was funded directly by the parent and not the parent's company, not the parent's employer. She said she found that out and she was so grateful. Um, the children understand what we're what I'm doing. My wife understands what I'm doing. I understand what they're doing. You know why there were a lot of divorces during COVID and shocking divorces, people who had known each other, who had been together for a while. It's simple, it's because these guys had no level, no semblance of integration. So you have a case where husband and wife are working in different places, obviously. And after work, maybe she goes to hang out with her friend. He goes to hang out with his friends or whatever. And so they were just coming home to sleep. They were basically flatmates. So when COVID came, they didn't have anything to talk about. They did not know even where to start because there had been no integration and therefore there could be absolutely no form of balance. And I ask parents all the time, do you know what your spouse does? Do you know 
what your children do. What is stressing them? You see, knowledge is a fundamental part of creating this balance. Knowledge. For instance, I know I look, and it took me time. You know what? Studying my spouse, studying my wife. You know, in the early days, in the very few months, first month, few months of our marriage, that was in 1992. Um, suddenly, my wife would get very irritable, very touchy and fretful. And I'm, this is first thing in the morning. I've not even had an opportunity to commit an offense. She just woke up angry. And I used to really, really get upset. At, Why is she like this? You know, we just got married. Why is she like this? That she wake up at certain, on certain days just angry. Then guess what? As I began to study, my background is in demography and social statistics. So I am the guy that always studies, and that's what I do for a living, cause and effect. So organizations call me and they say, we want this result. I go to do the research to find out what are we going to put in place to cause that result to be a natural progression. That's what I do. So I began to study and I realized this behavior from my wife came at a particular time of the month. I'm sure now you know what I'm talking about. But you see, it took patiently study, wanting to know the root cause. You know, you do a root cause analysis. And guess what? What was a potentially volatile situation now became a thing to just laugh about. So when she wakes up and gets irritable, I just say, hmm, it's that time of the month. Then she laughs, she says, leave me alone. And she laughs and it's over. So knowledge. To attain this work-life balance, you must know the you must know the people around you. Know the people around if this family, know people, um, know them, know what drives them. And then when the children begin to come, the reason a lot of people have problems with their children, especially in teenage years, which we never had, was because they never took time to know those children. I, I saw a research by a man called Laszlo Polga, um, Hungarian gentleman, and he believed that everybody was born a genius. Given the right conditions, it would manifest. I saw another study that had been done in Harvard and, you know, tests done for, for, for children below five, they all scored very, very high genius levels. But the same people, when they were tested by age 10 to 15, 70% had dropped out of the genius cadet. And it kept dropping off until, um, in their thirties, I think it was only 2% remained. Now, so Laszlo Polga believed everybody was born a genius, was a genius, but, 
and he decided to do an experiment to prove it. And what was the yardstick he was going to use? The yardstick was, he, he said he was not going to send his daughter to a conventional school. He was not going to send her to school. He was going to home train her. And the two things he would train her on would be chess and mathematics. Chess and mathematics. And he said he was going, the yardstick of genius he was going to use was that she would be a chess grandmaster, a genius at chess. So that's all he exposed her to. And by the age of 12, this young lady, um, I think it was Susan Polga, and you can Google this, became the best, one of the best chess players in the world. And in it, it was a time when in Hungary, women were not even allowed to play chess. She became the chess coach for the nation. First daughter, his second daughter, the same thing. His third daughter, the same thing. So, and this really helped me um, even in my work, but more so at home. I realized that if I created a certain kind of environment. Then I began to study other people that Mozart was composing at the age of five, but his dad was a music instructor. And so that was the only exposure he had ever had. You look at Venus and Serena Williams, you look at Tiger Woods, you look at Michael Jackson, you look at, you find out that they were products of a particular kind of environment. So I decided I was going to know my children so that my work and my family life could be integrated. I was going to know them. And so I began to study them and began to create the environment for the things I learned about them to thrive. Um, I opened them up to what I was doing. When I had money, they knew. When I did not have money, they knew. Um, I gave them the exposure. I got to know them so well. I knew my children so well. And let me tell you how three of them. If there was a knock on the door and there was a pause waiting for a response, that's my first son. If there was a knock, and as the door was being knocked, it was being opened. It's like, boom. That's my second son. <laughs> when the door just flies open without a knock, that's my daughter. <laughs> you know, I began to study. My first son could come to the to the, my dressing table and look at some perfume or whatever, say, Dad, um, can I use your perfume or your aftershave? I said, sure. Mm -hmm. That's my first son. My second son, he just goes there and he takes it, begins to use it. Dad, this our perfume has nearly finished though. <laughs> Knowing them. Now, I also began to understand even when they went off, they made mistakes. I knew exactly how to reach each one. So work-life integration, knowledge of the people you do life with, all right, is so important. Don't leave it to chance. 
And then another way I have, we've done this integration is a very simple policy. When at work, be at work. When at home, be at home. Now I know this, this was the toughest thing for me to do because as a consultant, um, especially, I mean, gosh, during COVID, my work was at home, you know, on Zoom and all that. But what I'm saying is you need to deliberately create that family time, create family memories. When you are able to create family memories, create memories so, so outlandish that they will last for a while. So when I'm at home, a typical Sunday, my, the children come home, um, we eat up a storm, and then we watch movies, we play Scrabble, we just be silly, you know? memories. Then I am that guy who out of the blue randomly would just say, all right, we're going for a cruise. Everybody is coming. Memories. Um, or we're, and so as we began to create these memories, we got more integrated and because we were more integrated, we ultimately became more balanced. I am involved in everything they do. They are involved in what I do. So when I started, I said, I don't really think, and I don't believe work-life balance is something you achieve by saying, I want to balance my work and my life. It will never balance. Because we all spend most more time at work than at home. And we all spend more time, you know? So there's no way I'm going to split my home time and work time equally. There's no way we're going to, those things are myths, but, when we are able to achieve a work-life integration, then you realize that when you look back, and like I am looking back 30 years after, I'm looking back and I realize, wow, we balance out. We balance out, you know, and when I look at the fact that, you know, I mean, all the children, like I said, they've graduated from university, they've left home. Um, look at the fact that it's my wife and I, you know, and I look at even that relationship is balanced because of the integration that we did. So I don't know, um, those are just some of the thoughts I wanted to drop, uh, and, and, and it, it, it goes, like I said, either way, my, my wife has come to understand me because she took time, just the way I took time to study and understand her. And even the Bible says that the men should deal with their wives according to knowledge. As I did, took time to do that. She also took time to understand me. She knew that when Wale goes into his study, you know, I don't want, I, I, number one, people look at me and I have a very public persona, but I'm a very deep introvert. I, I love my space. I don't go out. I don't like neighbors. I just stay, you know, that way. Now, they understand that. But my family, there's always time for my family. Oh, my God. You know? Um, and 
guess what? Even when they were younger, as they were starting their own businesses and their own journeys, my, my kids would just walk into my study and sit down and say, Dad, I just want to talk. And they talk. You know, we have that relationship. And um, <laughs> I'll end up with this. And it has now spilled to even their friends. So uh, when they were younger, their friends would say, oh, I'm coming to your house tomorrow. Tell my son or my daughter, my sons or my daughter, we're coming to your house tomorrow. They say, oh, okay. I won't be at home. And they say, oh, we're not coming to see you. We're coming to see your dad. <laughs> so their, their friends became like children to me. They became my friends. And they all want to talk. They all, so I, I, I have all these young people. I love spending a lot of time with them, just getting to understand them. And I think, and this is my part in short, people complain about the children, the young people of today. I don't think they are the problem. I think the parents are the problem. I cannot raise my kids the way I was raised. I cannot parent the way I was parented because it's a totally different world, different era. When I was young, um, oh gosh, I couldn't go and just initiate a conversation with my parents. No. All right. But these are some of the things I have learned over the years. I hope it added some value. And I will be willing to take any questions that people might have. And once again, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here with you this morning. Uh, thank you very much, Wale. Actually, that was uh, extremely, extremely insightful. I actually was expecting to hear on work-life balance, and you've brought up something new, work-life integration. Um, of course, uh, personally, I was almost beginning to feel like a failure, like it's so impossible to actually have very successful career and also successful on the other aspect. And there are all these wheel charts online. And when you go through them, you actually feel like you're failing. But actually, I've seen uh, the main thing you've said is integration, integrating the two. And even as doctors, sometimes you're at family gatherings or you're doing something else and you get called or you're even asleep and you get called to the hospital. And if truly it was in those clear cut lines, um, ideally you wouldn't be hitting the targets. But if the two are integrated now, I actually see that truly someone can have a fruitful life and be able to, uh, to achieve what they're supposed to achieve. Um, so we'll welcome questions. Um, none have been posted in the chat group, so you can actually unmute and ask. We are 108. Our questions are welcome. Um, as people are uh, thinking, I want to ask, so how does someone remain consistent? Morning. Oh, oh Professor Gutu, um, go ahead. Good morning. What a morning. beautiful talk. And I enjoyed your talk. Now, I would like you to look at one aspect which most people leave out and they don't really pay attention to. And this affects us as doctors so much. The aspect of looking at the family as a unit and also how it uh, relates to our work and maybe tie it up with family unity. You have the family as a unit and you, have, you look at also family unity in relation to our work, how the two tend to take divergent ways and what can we do to bring it together? Thank you very much, Prof. Um, again, it has to be, it, it's a lot of hard work it has to be deliberate. Um, once my daughter got into very bad company and they were suspended from school, okay? Um, and I realized she was little girl there. And I realized this is 
a crucial moment. How I deal with this will determine how things go. Because, of course, uh, people were taking sides. So I took her out for dinner. And I say, and I said to her, what happened? She explained what happened to me. And apparently, what a number of the school later proved it, that the boys had spiked their drinks because they wanted to take advantage of them. Now, I could have acted on the suspension. And that's what my parents would have done. But the greatest virtue in harmonizing, dealing with the family as a unit and ensuring the family unity, like you said, Prof, is listening. I can't overemphasize the power of listening. And it's not just listening to what has been said, but listening to what has not been said. Um, i give you an example. <laughs> and I've mastered the art of listening after 30 years. Last week, my wife mentioned casually that, oh, um, my, I'm an orphan, my both parents are now, and casually, oh, Wally, um, daddy is going for his eye eye operation uh, next week. I said, oh, okay, fine. So we left it at that. What she said was that daddy is going for his eye operation. My wife is brilliant. She's, the, she's a super genius. So she doesn't forget things. A few days later, she mentioned it. Oh, did I tell you daddy is going for his <laughs> eye operation? I said, yeah, you did. Wicked. I so I'm doing my stuff. When it came up the third time, prof, I knew what she was not saying. What she was not saying is that we need to send some cash home. <laughs> That is what she was not saying. So I now said, ah, you know, I think we need to send some cash to them, you know, all that. <laughs> that is what he was not. Saying. So in answering your question, we need to listen. Listen to what is being said listen to what is not being said. And more often than not, your answers and the strategy for handling the family on, the, on those levels will come from what was not said. And that's why listening becomes one of the biggest skills. My, my second son, his work, it is doing very well, but he's saving. I also advise that you need to save a lot, you know. So even though he makes a lot of money, he, you know, so he calls me from time to time. So he was, he was we are, we, most of the time I stay, we stay in the coast, in Kilifi County. And so the children want to come this weekend. And he's bringing his girlfriend home for the first time. We know her, but he's bringing her home. And you know what, then 
I mean, he runs his business. So when he travels, he does the SGR, he does the bus. Sometimes I don't interfere. But then he told me, he said, Dad, I'm coming home with Ashley, you know. Um, how, how okay is the, is, the, is the train to bring her? I said, you've gone on the train before. You know it's okay. Okay. Then, Dad, you know, Ashley has not been on the bus before. And she thinks it's... Now, <laughs> you're hearing what is not being said. So I said, oh, and do you want me to loan you some money for your ticket? Ah, you want to do that? Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> so I get my office to book a flight for them. Now, the point I'm making again, you will get to achieve the unity, the unity, success of the unit and unity of the, of the unit by listening. I hope that made sense, Prof. beautifully put. I think you have really brought out the aspect of what a family unit we need to do and more so in our working environment where everybody walks in, you want to take a quick bite, no time to discuss. The best you want, oh, this patient who I had has given me problems the next thing you sleep. So there's no time to interrogate with your members of your family, or even if you had a problem with this patient, did you give them time to give you their side of the story from a layman's point of view, so that you can listen to the story from the other divide, from the lay point of view, so that it can be able to improve your relationship with your colleagues and your relationship with your patient, and also to be able to bring you down to reality, to calm you down. Because when you are discussing about it, what you're actually trying to do is to get a second person or a second group of people to give you their other perspective of what you did so that you can come back to reality and you become a human being again and not a machine in the hospital. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you very much, Prof. So good to someone is asking the chat box, and uh, this is something that I feel a lot of medics can relate to. Um, either they're about to go through this stage, or they're in this stage, or they've just come out of it. Uh, so some doctors end up having dysfunctional families as their careers peak. Uh, the family disintegrates. The social and religious aspect disintegrates. Some wallow in alcoholism. How can we turn the tide and become more wholesome members of society? Fantastic question. And I love the use of the word disintegrate, which is why I started by using the word integrate, <laughs> you know, and it's got to be deliberate. Now, if you find yourself in a place where that's what's happening right now, you know, one of the things I have learned is when things, you know, a crisis doesn't happen doesn't just happen. A crisis is the end result of changes that were not managed. So we see the cracks, the peel, it begins to, things begin to peel off. And my advice, when saying you, you suddenly find yourself in that position is this, don't, look, if I'm told, when you're going to, um, if you want to go to Athi River, you go on the on, on Uhuru Highway, going south, and you pass the airport, and um, you will get to, maybe they say there are three petrol stations, and then you turn right, assuming just hypothetically. Now, if you are going and they tell you, you turn right, that'll be after 30 minutes. If you are going and you've been driving for one hour and you don't see those petrol stations, 
You don't need a rocket scientist to tell you you are on the wrong path. What do you do when you discover you are on the wrong path? What do you do? You go back to the last time you knew you were on track. And I get a lot of people come over and say exactly what, you, what you, the question was. Oh, it's all messed up. People say, oh, I wish I knew what you just, what you talked about earlier on. And I ask the question, let's trace our steps backwards. Where did things begin to crack? When you get people to think like that, let me tell you what I have seen. So this is not theory. I have seen somebody, wasn't a doctor, but whose life had reached that point you are talking about. And they went back. What did they go back? Realize, oh my goodness. You know, I treated my spouse badly at this stage. Try make peace there. Just go back. Try to mend the fences, build the bridges. Now, the beautiful effect of that is this. Even if when you try to make peace, they don't want peace, guess what you'd have done for yourself? You would have emptied yourself. You'd have gotten rid of some baggage. Because it's very important we travel light. All right. So that's my, that's my, and then if that doesn't work or if you feel that is dead, then convert your mistakes into lessons and begin to mentor other people how not to fall in the same trap. That's what I had to do in the area of my business when my business failed. You know, so when you realize, okay, you know what, this thing isn't going to work, then you know what, what are the lessons? And then just move on. You need to be a master at personal rebranding. You know, you need to be a master at that personal rebranding. Just, and go have, there was a lady, and I'll shut up after this. There was a lady, um, I met her in Dallas Lab. She was very senior in a bank at the executive level. And she was so bitter. She said, oh, men are dogs. Men are this. She had nothing to say about, nothing good to say about any man. I told her. I said, I'm a statistician. There are billions of men on the earth. One man is a very poor sample. You cannot make a decision on all men because of one man. I said, does that even make sense to you? And I, I said, correct me if I'm wrong. I'm sure this man hurt you big time. Yeah. Okay, good. And I'm sure he has moved on. <laughs> I said, yeah. That was the root of the bitterness. You know, that was the root. You know, so... Um, when such a thing happens and you know you cannot change the past, please move on with dignity and use the mistakes. The, 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 the greatest revenge you can exert on your mistakes is to ensure that nobody else makes those mistakes because you now use your mistakes. Mm -hmm as lessons for others. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that. Um, actually quite insightful. Um, seeing Professor Chesrem's hand uh, is up. Kindly go ahead. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ondieke, for that opportunity. Mine is to ask Dr. Wale, first of all, to compliment him for the great talk. I'm sure we will walk out of this uh, session and read. Uh, mine is a concern for the fraternity call doctors who are being addressed today. It's purely 
uh, medics, but it has been open to the entire university. As we are talking, we are working on extending to the entire university. So our links are very wide. Uh, my concern is about medics. We are the, regarded as the cream de la cream in the society because by high qualification, we end up being in medicine. Uh, but sometimes that intelligence is not reflected in other areas in terms of our cohesiveness. How do you help us medics to light more candles instead of deeming for others, such that we become a powerhouse in terms of what people regard us to be? Just to have a mindset whereby we realize who we are and the power we have to change either spoken or unspoken way, whereby we build each other, we don't actually demolish each other, but at the end of it, the more candles we light should make a statement. Thank you very much. Thank you, Prof. Um, let me give you some other professions that have a lot of challenges in, um, uh, for instance, when we go to a lot of organizations now, the IT people um, are the most at risk, IT and finance. And that's because they can do their work just focused on their screen. They don't need to be social. Well, they think they, but it works against them and even damages their performance at some point. Um, and so my advice is always, uh, we need to, we need to be so emotionally intelligent. And when I'm talking about emotionally intelligent, I can teach you emotional intelligence in 60 seconds. And this is it. You identify somebody in your life, in your workspace, where, since we're talking about the workspace, identify somebody in your workspace that you will go out of your way to help. You will just, you just want that person to succeed. Identify that person, whether as a colleague on the same level, senior or junior, just somebody that you connect with and you will just like to do anything to help that person succeed. Now, when I ask people, we don't have the time now. Um, I've already shot past my time. Apologies for that. When I ask people to make a list of, so think of this person, they think of the person, then I say, what are the attributes of that person that you like? Do you know the attributes they say? Oh, he's helpful, he's supportive, he listens, he's understanding. He's, and they name all those attributes and we never find somebody say, oh, he's a genius, he went to Harvard. <laughs> we never hear that. You hear supportive, listens, cares, those are the things. Now, that means, and those are the indices for the emotionally intelligent person. And you know what? You don't need a budget for them. You can, do you need a budget to listen? No. Do you need a budget to be interested in others? No. Do you need a budget to be caring? No. Do you need a budget to help, to be helpful? No, you don't need a budget for all that. But if you begin to deliberately decide, I'm going to be more helpful, I'm going to be more caring, I'm going to be more, uh, a big, better listener, I'm going to be like, then people around you will say, you would have lit their candles. And they will be the ones saying, if you ask them that name one person, that you will go out of your way to help. They will mention your name. I mean, we've done this in so many countries and it just works, all right? So emotional intelligence is key. And as we began to teach IT people, because they felt, I just knew this myself, we began to teach them 
began to teach finance people and even people in your profession to become more social. And that person, that is more caring. And the irony of it is this, the medical profession is a caring profession, but many medical practitioners, professionals, are not caring individuals. I don't know if that makes sense. <laughs> you know, in interacting with a lot of them, they're very, in my way, individualistic and all that, because you're brilliant. You're also super, super brilliant. All right, I hope I have answered that. I've overshot the wrong way of time. <laughs> Thank you very um, actually, much. Uh, Dr. Wole, we are within time, unless oh. you're rushing to something else. Um, because there are quite a couple of some questions which I feel. Oh, wow. Okay, I all right, no problem. I'm supposed to have a session with the Africa Development Bank boss uh this morning. Mm -hmm. It was for 8:30, but that, let's just go on. Um, so I'll put them together. So a person okay. is asking, um, did you at any one point uh, get swamped with your schedule and uh, have to make a drastic reorganization to your daily routine? And uh, another person is asking, um, are there successful business-wise people with successful families? Um, I consider that there should be a strengthening of life over work, and especially for doctors. We unfortunately favor work over life, and the issue then uh, becomes we cannot live after work. Like we cannot have a life after work. Yeah. All right, did I get swamped? Yes, there were times when I got swamped, and, and this is the beautiful thing. In fact, the two questions are kind of connected, you know, because I learned this, and it was such a powerful lesson I learned earlier on, that my family is my greatest insurance for the day my business does not work. <laughs> you know, I tell you, if you have somebody who business fails, for those of us in business, business fails, if the family is solid, they are more likely to bounce back than if business fails and family has failed. That's when they get into depression, they get into alcoholism, they get into a whole lot of things. So yes, I got swamped. What did I do? I came back to the family, all right? And through that, I was rebuilt, I was, you know, charged and all that. So I view my family as the greatest insurance for my business life. I hope that makes sense. Um, Dr. Bosire, I hope that made sense, and to Dr. Osom, it actually makes sense, it really does, because at the end of it all, these are the people you have waiting for you at home. Listen, um, so my business failed, uh, Doc, my business failed. Let me tell you how I learned this lesson. I'm somebody who loves to give, and I love to help people. And uh, I, I, I would give things, I would, you know, I would even give away cars to, to people. I would give things. When my business failed, my phone stopped ringing. I would have the phone all day and not a call. And it was such a painful realization that at the end of the day, people were relating with me for what I meant to them what I could for, not for who I was. And when all was said and done, who was, who were the people left with me? Family. So they had to suffer the consequences with me. The people that sometimes you neglect family for, you think they care? They just move on. And so that led to my very, very serious policy of family first. And when I get family first, every other thing works. 
Uh, thank you. I, I had similar comments echoed by Bitangen Demo when he lost his job as the PS of Information and Technology. His phone went quiet. Absolutely. Uh, so that's when you realize at the end of the day, all you have actually is a family. The other things come second. Um, so thank you very much, uh, Dr. Wale. On Monday, uh, the medical fraternity lost an icon, a titan uh, of pediatrics. And what came out in the tributes that followed is that actually uh, Professor Musoke embodied uh, these principles of work life. We call it integration. Now I'm even changing my terms, uh, work life integration. Uh, she was diligent to her fault in her execution of work. Uh, she was balanced in terms of family. Um, she, she appeared to have a supportive family. She had a passion for music, uh, which she transferred to the firstborn son. Uh, the guy had a background in engineering, but actually moved and now he's a teacher teacher of music. Um, she had a passion for the underprivileged. Uh, she gave her time to Nyumbani Children's Home and encouraged her mentees uh, to do the same. So I'd actually like to take this opportunity, kindly allow us, um, for us to give a minute of silence uh, to Professor Musoke. So thank you very much, everybody. Um, clearly, we've had balance is very important. Next to love, love of God, uh, love for family. Uh, the next thing is balance. Uh, we just have to be balanced in our whole body, in our minds, uh, balanced in our emotions. Uh, our whole being needs to be balanced. And I would like to call upon each one of us to actually take up the principles that we've learned today. And uh, just to summarize that we need to know the people around us. Let us listen to them, let us understand them, um, and let us create memories. At the end of the day, it's the memories that we'll have to be able to, uh, to, to carry us on. Um, on tomorrow, we are having a, a run, a don't leave a medic behind. Um, the t-shirts are being sold. And uh, in the spirit of work-life integration, it's not all about work. So kindly let us all show up tomorrow for, for the run. Um, it's only a thousand shillings for, for the t-shirts. Uh, some people will have to walk, some people will have to run, some people will have to be carried, but kindly please let us all show up. So at this point, I would like to thank uh, God uh, for his grace, mercy and guidance uh, during this session. I would like to give uh, uh, credit to our leadership, uh, Professor Cheserem. Thank you for being supportive of this initiative. I would also like to give a special thanks to Dr. Wale Akinyemi for gracing us with this talk. Um, it was done pro bono. Uh, for the information of everybody. And uh, we're extremely uh, grateful to Dr. Wale for that. I would also like, like to thank each one of us for showing up, uh, showing up for ourselves. So let us continue uh, learning together. Let us grow together and uh, let us soar together. So thank you very much, everybody. Um, and let us have a good day. <laughs>